All right. Is this on? Can people hear me? Yeah. So the title of my talk today is The Future of Solar System Exploration. Anytime you have a talk whose title begins with The Future Of, you should approach it with a certain degree of trepidation. Uh, things rarely turn out the way you expect. In my normal everyday work, I'm accustomed to using instrumentation like this to solve the problems that I then go and talk about. I've had to instead use instrumentation more like this uh, to prepare this talk. I will say, however, that my efforts have been aided substantially by having participated for the last two years, uh, as was just mentioned, in uh, preparing the Planetary Decadal Survey. And so that will be my guide uh, today as I talk to you about what the next 10 and more years of uh, exploration of the solar system will hold. So what is a decadal survey? It's something that, as the name implies, is done every 10 years at the request of NASA and the NSF. And it's conducted by the National Research Council. And it's basically a process that involves the broad US planetary science community trying to come up with a consensus plan for space exploration, and in the case of planetary decadal, specific to the solar system, uh, that NASA and also the National Science Foundation can use to design their programs of science and exploration. I will not go at length through the process that we follow, but it was a lengthy and arduous one. It involved hundreds of individuals within the science community providing input to us. Uh, two years of effort. It was very substantial outreach to the community and it was fundamentally driven by the science needs that were identified by the planetary scientists in the United States. So based on all of the many inputs that we got from our town halls and our white papers and all that we did, we identified a total of 25 different mission candidates that were chosen to undergo detailed study. We had studies for those that were performed by APL, by JPL, and also here at Goddard. And the, the work that was done on these studies by these study teams was absolutely fantastic. You know, my, my, one of my favorite parts of the whole flight project game has always been the part at the beginning that I call a blank sheet of paper. When you sit down with a blank sheet of paper and a set of goals for something you want to achieve at some distant planet, and then you say, okay, well, now how are we going to do this and make it work? And this job was doing that 25 times over. It was a lot of fun. Um, the studies involved a lot of time, a lot of effort. It was all funded by, uh, by NASA headquarters. Many millions of dollars were spent. And uh, if you want to read these reports, all 25 of them have been uh, posted on the web. They're available as part of the Decadal Survey Report. It was quite an effort. One thing that distinguished this Decadal Survey from all that have come before was that we were charged with coming up with a plan for planetary exploration that would actually be executable within projected resources for the decade to come. And that meant that in contrast to other past decadals which have just been sort of shopping lists of the, re the really cool missions, we had to come up with price tags for our missions and then make some tough decisions to make it all fit. Now, in order to come up with the price tags, um, we took a pretty conservative approach. I told you about those mission studies. The mission studies were done here at Goddard and elsewhere. And the teams that did the mission studies as part of their study process produced a cost number. We took that cost number, we said thank you very much, and we disregarded it. And what we did instead was we contracted with the Aerospace Corporation to do independent cost and technical evaluations. And the way those were done, now you're, many of you are probably familiar basically with this process, it's based on multiple different methodologies, but it is largely grounded in looking at the actual costs of analogous missions that have flown in the past. As they were built, as they were flown, with all their overruns and all the things that went wrong. And using that as a basis for projecting costs. And the intention is to avoid the inherent optimism that tends to be part of the process of designing and flying one of these missions. Anybody who is willing to devote years of, the, years of their career to building a complex, expensive piece of hardware and then putting it on top of a rocket and shooting it into space is by nature an optimist. <laughs> right? 
understand? <laughs> Optimism is fine, but it's not a good way to cost things. Okay, so we took this different approach. The result is some significant sticker shock. Uh, if you look at the panel on the right, you'll see those two bars towards the top. This is a particular mission in our plan. It was costed by the advocates of that mission at uh, $2.2 billion and by aerospace at $3.5 billion. If you do the math, that's a factor of pi over two. And so there was some pretty substantial sticker shock associated with this, but these were the numbers that we used. And all the numbers I'm gonna quote you, by the way, are FY15 dollars. The way we prioritized missions was on the basis of two primary criteria. First, science return per dollar. Science return as judged by the experts on our committees. Dollars as determined by the aerospace cost and technical evaluation process. The secondary criterion that we used was programmatic balance. That is trying to find an appropriate balance across the solar system of all solar system bodies. And also trying to find an appropriate balance between large, medium, and small missions. And then there were two other kind of gates that any mission had to get through in order to be recommended. And those were, first of all, technical readiness. The technology had to be there. And also availability of appropriate trajectories so you can get there from here. Um, the process, all of the recommendations were guided strongly by science community inputs, and all of the recommendations that I showed you, that I will show you, were achieved, uh, were reached by achieving strong consensus in the group. Okay, a uh, couple of preliminary things before I get into the missions themselves. We did recommend a modest increase in the research and analysis program. This is the program of grants and contracts that scientists at NASA centers and universities use to do their bread and butter research. And we recommended a, a, a bump up of 5% in the first year and then a growth of 1.5% above inflation uh, in the years after that. If you look at NASA's planetary RNA program, these programs are massively oversubscribed. The, su the success rate for pro proposals is quite low. And if you spend more money, you're going to get more good science. And so we, we definitely recommend it doing that. Another thing, and this is one of our strongest recommendations, is the importance of establishing and protecting a line of funding for technology development that is specific to solar system exploration. We have this recurring problem at NASA where when a mission starts to overrun and you gotta get money from someplace, the tempting place to go is a technology program. So you raid the technology program, you, set, you solve your immediate problem, but now the technology development funding is not there to enable the next mission to have be initiated with robust technology, and so that one overruns. I see a lot of people nodding up and down. You've all seen this, right? Okay, and so we strongly recommend that NASA establish a technology line within the planetary program funded at about 6 to 8% of the total planetary budget. That's about $100 million a year. And, and rigorously protect that from incursions because it's, it's just a necessary thing to do. Okay. Going to go small, then medium, then large as we go through the missions. The planetary missions in the small class are the Discovery Program. And I don't have to tell this audience what a success the Discovery Program has been. You can see uh, results from five different Discovery missions there. It has been a fantastically successful program. In the most recent call for Discovery proposals, NASA got 28 proposals. So there are a lot more good ideas out there. Uh, we recommend that the discovery program just continue. Continue it at its current level, adjusted for inflation, with a cost cap that stays the same, again, adjusted for inflation. One of the most important recommendations that we make regarding discovery is that the cadence of AOs and selections be regular and predictable. This is a big deal. If you've ever participated in writing a discovery proposal, you know how much work it is. And it's very hard to keep your team of scientists and engineers together and working towards a goal of an AO coming out if dates are shifting around and don't even know when it's going to happen. So we recommend very strongly that NASA try to put out discovery AOs and select missions with a regular cadence. We make no specific recommendations regarding the content, the science content of the discovery program, and that's by design. That's as it should be. The whole idea behind discovery is that these are ideas that arise from the community, 
they compete via the AO and peer review process and the best missions win. So it's working, we just don't want to mess with it. Okay, New Frontiers. Uh, this was a program that came about as a result of recommendations from the last Decadal survey, 10 years ago. And in the intervening decade, two New Frontiers missions have been selected. One is the New Horizons mission that's on its way to Pluto right now. The second one is the Juno mission, soon to be launched to Jupiter. Um, we feel that the, uh, that the uh, New Frontiers program is going exceptionally well, and we also recommend its continuation. There is, there is very soon going to be selection of the third New Frontiers mission. We, that's an ongoing selection. We didn't address that at all. Um, we did, however, recommend a restructure of the cost cap for New Frontiers missions. Right now, if you take the cost cap for New Frontiers missions and you inflate it to FY15 dollars, it's about 1.05 billion, including the cost of the launch vehicle. What we, re we recommend is changing that cost cap to 1.0 billion, but excluding the launch vehicle costs. We do this for two reasons. The first is, if you do the math, that winds up being a modest increase in the cost cap. And what we found was that by increasing the cost cap, not too much, a little bit, we were able, even with the conservative cost estimates that were done, to capture under that cap some extremely exciting missions, which I'll show you in just a moment. The other reason is that there's enormous volatility at the present in launch vehicle costs. Launch vehicle costs are fluctuating a lot. They're going up a great deal. And again, it's very hard to put together one of these proposals. The New Frontiers proposal is a huge effort. It's very difficult to plan one of these things if you don't, if you gotta capture the cost of the rocket under your cap that you don't have, know how much the rocket's gonna cost. And it might go up, in, in which case you gotta do less science. So we do this to protect these proposal teams from the volatility in the launch vehicle costs. And we recommend that NASA select two New Frontiers missions, New Frontiers 4 and 5 in the decade in question. Uh, for the New Frontiers 4 selection, what we recommend is that the selection be made from among the following five candidate missions. A comet surface sample return, bringing the material back from the surface of the comet nucleus. A sample return mission from the far side of the moon where there's an enormous basin that has blown through the lunar crust and down into the mantle so you can actually see inside the moon and, and sample the lunar mantle. Uh, something we've not done with any of the Apollo samples. A Saturn probe. This is a mission that would go to the Saturn system and complete the investigation of the Saturn system begun by Cassini and Huygens by putting an entry probe into the atmosphere of the planet itself. Uh, Trojan Tour and Rendezvous, this is a mission to the Trojan asteroids that are co-orbital with Jupiter and a Venus in situ explorer, which is a Venus lander using modern technology to make substantial advances beyond what was done by the Soviets back in the day. We assign no relative priorities among these five missions, again, because it's up to the peer review uh, process to sort it out. And if the mission that NASA selects for New Frontiers addresses, New Frontiers 3 addresses one of those five, you pluck that one on the list, off the list, and you have four left. For New Frontiers 5, we recommend taking whatever's left from New Frontiers 4 and adding two more. One is an Io observer. This is a spacecraft that would go into orbit around Jupiter on a highly eccentric orbit and do multiple flybys of Io, the volcanic moon of Jupiter, and a lunar geophysical network, which would be a network of seismic stations and, and other geophysical measurements distributed around the moon. And again, we don't assign any relative priorities to these. Okay, now the flagship missions. I got a bunch of flagship missions for you. Way more than we can afford. Okay, but it's for reasons that will become clear as I go through this, it's valuable to have a list of flagships because they come at very different costs. And you may have to work your way down this list of ways before you get to something you can actually afford. Our highest priority recommended flagship is to begin the process of returning samples from Mars using a mission called MAX-C, that stands for Mars Astrobiology Explorer Cacher that would land and collect a suite of samples to come back. And I'll describe that in more detail in a moment. The second priority flagship is investigating what is probably an ocean on Jupiter's moon Europa. 
with an orbiter. Uh, both of these missions, by the way, the two top priority missions, both have to be massively descoped from what's currently conceived in order to have any chance of being affordable, and I'll talk about that also. Um, the third mission is the first in-depth exploration of an ice giant planet. If you look at the outer solar system, there are basically two kinds of planets. There are the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, which we've really learned a lot about, and there are the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, which are totally different class of objects. And all we've got is the Voyager flyby uh, to, to tell us about that. So a Uranus orbiter and probe mission, and then down at the bottom there, but still excellent missions, are an Enceladus orbiter. This is, Enceladus is this tiny moon of Saturn that has geysers erupting from the South Pole, and a, a mission to Venus to really characterize that planet's climate in detail. Okay, Max C. In fact, I've labeled it Max C ExoMars, and I'll explain why in just a moment. We've reached the point in Mars science where in order to make the next significant increment in scientific knowledge, we've got to bring samples back. The Mars program is in a sense a victim of its own success. If you look at all that has been accomplished over the past 15 years of Mars exploration and then what is still to come with MSL, MAVEN, uh, there's, you know, sample return is the next reasonable thing to do. What this mission would do, would, it would do some science on the surface, but fundamentally what it's about is collecting a cache of samples that will ultimately come back to Earth. And it is the first mission in a three mission campaign that extends into the next decade. The only mission that is recommended for this decade is Max C. The others would come subsequently. This is envisioned as being a partnership with the European Space Agency. And it is, it, it, the, the, the whole sample return campaign is enabled by that partnership. The only way you can afford this is if both partners make substantial financial contributions to the total package. Uh, the campaign is inherently multi-decadal, and this recommendation is based on, as I said, science return per dollar. But the way we judged this was by looking at the science return of the return samples when they eventually get back, and the cost to NASA of the entire three-mission campaign. That's the only reasonable way to judge this. The mission is currently designed, and again, we're gonna have to discope this to make this work. The mission that's currently designed would actually deliver two big, substantial rovers to the Martian surface using a derivative of the entry, descent, and landing system that is going to be used on MSL. One of the rovers would be this one here, Max C. This is the NASA rover that collects the samples. The other one, and this is part of this partnership with ESA, is the ExoMars rover, which is a rover that is focused on astrobiology objectives that would do in situ science, including a one to two meter class drill that can drill down into the Martian soil and acquire samples. These are two big honking rovers. They're not as big as MSL, but they're both bigger than Spirit and Opportunity. So these are big vehicles. This was the current plan as presented to us. The next thing that would happen, some years later, and one of the nice things about this mission concept is that once you collect that sample cache, they don't have a short shelf life. They can sit in the Martian environment for a long time before you go get them. So it enables you to distribute the costs over time. But this next mission happens in the subsequent decade. It lands near the sample cache, sends out a little rover to pick it up, gather it in, put it into the nose of a two-stage rocket Mars ascent vehicle that then puts a spacecraft the size of a coconut bearing these precious samples into orbit around Mars. Subsequently, another mission comes along. <laughs> they rendezvous with that coconut, gathers it in, and sends it on a trajectory back to Earth. This is difficult stuff. This will be the hardest robotic planetary mission ever attempted by a substantial margin, this total uh, three mission campaign. Now, it has to be descoped. When we did the cost, of, I showed you that one, that, that the project estimate was 2.2 and the Kate estimate was 3.5, that was max C. The estimate for the cost of just the NASA portion of max C and ExoMars together was $3.5 billion. That's too much. If you look ahead to what 
any, any reasonable budget projections, that consumes too much of the necessary, NASA planetary budget in the view of our committee to preserve appropriate programmatic balance. It's just too much money being spent on Mars and Mars alone. Okay, so we recommend that NASA go ahead and do this mission, but only if they can bring that cost down to no more than $2.5 billion. The reason it costs three and a half is because you're trying to deliver two big rovers with the MSL Interdescent Landing System, which was not designed for that. And it would have to be completely redesigned, it would grow substantially in cost, mass, and complexity, and we don't want to see it go that way, because it just costs too much. So we recommend that NASA and ESA work together to find a way to get this thing down to a cost of 2.5 to NASA. We are not specific about how that process proceed, because certainly as the U.S. Planetary Decadal Survey, we're not empowered to negotiate deals with other national, or with international space agencies. Okay, but the cost has to come down. And th that number of 2.5 was not arrived at arbitrarily. We actually did do a costing exercise where we asked ourselves, what would it cost to deliver just one of these rovers? Either one. Using the MSL Entry Descent Landing System, and that came out under 2.5. So we're convinced that there's a good mission in there somewhere. But if you can't get to 2.5, we recommend that this mission be deferred to a subsequent decade or just canceled outright. And there's no plan B. There's no plan B for Mars. We looked at a bunch of other Mars missions, things that you might do at Mars, and none of them on the basis of science return per dollar measured up to these other missions that we've got to the, the, the New Frontiers candidates that I told you about, to the Enceladus mission, or the Venus mission, or the Europa mission. Okay, so it's kind of this or nothing for Mars. Okay, Europa, fantastically exciting target. Uh, it's the moon of Jupiter, it's roughly the size of the Earth's moon, it has this crust of ice, but it is solidly believed that beneath that crust of ice, is an ocean of liquid water. Two reasonably accessible oceans in our solar system. Earth has one, Europa has the other. And the thing that makes it really exciting is you go to the bottom of the Earth's ocean and there's all sorts of interesting biology going on. So what's happening on Europa? This is a fantastically important target. So our number two priority flagship is a Jupiter-Europa orbiter. It would go into orbit around Jupiter with a suite of instruments, including altimetry, Radar, long wavelength radar that can see through the ice, uh, infrared spectroscopy, things that can look for little puffs of vapor, everything that you can imagine really to study the ocean that might lie beneath that ice. Problem is, it's extraordinarily expensive. And again, this needs to be massively descoped. The Kate number for JEO, for the Jupiter European Orbiter, was $4.7 billion. That just eats the planetary program, all of them. That's that. that just leads to a complete imbalance in the cost of the program. And so we recommend JEO as the second highest priority mission, but only if it can be reduced substantially in cost. And it will probably require an increase in the overall NASA planetary budget to make this happen. We want to see JEO happen, but not at the expense of these other missions that we're recommending. And that's very tough. So one of our strongest recommendations to NASA is that the agency immediately begin an effort to find major cost reductions in JEO. The right thing to do is to not give up on JEO. The right thing to do is to figure out how to make it less expensive. And we strongly urge NASA to immediately engage with the science community to find a way to get the cost of this mission down to the point where it can realistically be afforded. Our third priority, this was, a, this was a, a surprise to some people. A lot of people didn't see this one coming. Uh, but this is a mission we're very excited about. As I said, there are basically two kinds of planets in the outer solar system, and the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, are fundamentally different from the gas giants. Uh, they have much less hydrogen and helium. They have a much greater endowment of uh, ices and other uh, less volatile materials. Um, it's the one class of planet that we've never really explored in detail. Voyager 2 flew by both of these guys with 70s and 60s technology, and that's it. That's all we know. So this would be an orbiter 
and an atmospheric entry probe. We think this mission has the same kind of potential for scientific discovery at Uranus that Cassini did at Saturn and Galileo did at Jupiter. Now, why Uranus? Why not Neptune? Remember I said there were those two gates, technology readiness and trajectories? It turns out that for the decade from 2013 to 2022, the trajectories to Uranus are better than the trajectories to Neptune. And also, Neptune requires some technologies that Uranus does not, particularly aero capture, that are not quite ready. So Uranus winds up winning out over Neptune for sheer practical reasons. For this decade, if it did get bumped downstream, uh, Neptune could be a good candidate. Okay, technology development. Uh, I did mention that we have this recommendation of a $100 million technology program. If you go to the Decadal Report, there's a very long chapter that describes in detail how that should be spent. But let me just describe four key missions for the next decade, the one beyond the one we talked about, that are in need of technology development. One is a mission to Titan. Fantastic place. It's this moon of Saturn with a dense atmosphere of nitrogen, a little bit of methane in it, liquid methane and ethane on the surface. There's rain, there's rivers, there's lakes. Fantastic place. Um, we costed out a Titan surface system mission. It came out to $6.7 billion. So it was very expensive. Uh, but we think with some carefully directed, thoughtful technology development, that cost can be brought down and we can do this very important mission in the not too distant future. Another is developing the technologies for Neptune, particularly aero capture, that would enable that mission in a subsequent decade. And then, while the first mission in that Mars sample return campaign, the technology is basically ready to go. We know how to land rovers on Mars and drive them around. Um, the technologies for the second and third mission, particularly the ascent vehicle, that will get those rocks off the surface, require some significant investment. All right, now, I said at the beginning, it all has to fit. Somehow we have to be able to afford all of this. We have our cost estimates, and then we were provided at the beginning of this process by NASA with a set of budget projections out into the decade. So this waterfall chart, it's got uh, real, year, real year dollars on the vertical axis and fiscal years on the horizontal axis shows the, the cost wedge we were given to work with. The colorful curves at the left that you see tapering off, those are the current program to which NASA is already committed. So this is Cassini, this is Spirit and Opportunity, this is the ongoing RNA program, this is MAVEN, this is the next New Frontiers mission, etc. Okay, so all of that tapers off with time, and then that big red wedge over on the right, that was, the, mission, that was the, the wedge that we were told to try to fill with missions. Now, I showed you that picture at the start of his talk of me gazing into the crystal ball. Right? The one thing that I can say with confidence is about the future is that's not going to happen. <laughs> Whatever happens will be different from that. And I say that with the utmost confidence. <laughs> so what we recognized was that in order for an, our advice to be actionable, in order for the plan that we recommended to be something that decision makers can actually use, we needed to also include not just recommended missions and priorities, but we had to include specific decision rules and tripwires that can be used to adjust our recommended program to whatever the budget reality turns out to be in the future. Otherwise, it's advice that nobody can use. Um, for entertainment purposes, there actually is a section in our report about what to do if the budget gets better. So if you want to read it, it's real fun reading. But I'm just going to talk about the other one. What do you do if less funding is available? Our recommendation is that if less funding is available, the first thing you go after is those flagship missions. And the reason for that is that New Frontiers and Discovery are the less expensive, shorter time scale missions that provide a steady stream of accomplishments and scientific discoveries. These flagship missions have time scales that are very long, 10, 15, 20 years. If you gotta wait 15 or 20 years for all of your science, 
If you go after discovery and new frontiers and you wipe those out so that you can get your flagships, you've got a community that's sitting around waiting for data for a decade or two decades, and that leads to complete stagnation of the community. That's not an acceptable, acceptable way to do business. And so the clear message that we got from our community is if you have to cut things, go after these very expensive, very long time scale missions first. So the first thing you do if the budget gets bad is you descope or delay flagship missions. Uh, you slip new frontiers and or discovery only if adjustments to the flagships cannot solve the problem. And you place very high priority on trying to preserve funding for RA and technology development. So let's follow that through. Let's follow through the logic of that and look at what the decision rules mean for the flagships if the budget gets bad. Our recommendation is protect RNA, protect technology, protect discovery, protect new frontiers. Don't go after those. Go somewhere else. All right, so what happens if the budget gets worse? We recommend that NASA fly Max C and X and Mars only if two, things are, two conditions are met. First, the cost to NASA is no more than $2.5 billion. And second, that it re leads realistically to sample return. Okay, the, the, that mission only has high priority if the samples come back. If the samples don't come back, it doesn't have high priority. And if, it, if, the, if your approach to descoping max C would be to somehow break the partnership with ESA, you can no longer afford the second and third missions in the campaign, and so the samples don't come back. So that's no good. You have to have a plan that is going to lead realistically to sample return. So those criteria both have to be met. If those criteria are not met for whatever reason, then the second priority is JEO, the Europa Orbiter mission. As I said, there is no recommended plan B for Mars. It's not like some other Mars mission comes in and takes the place of that one. There isn't one that's nearly as high priority as Europa. If you can't afford JEO, I got a Uranus mission to, to sell you. Okay, that won't cost you 2.7 billion, so it's not cheap either. And if you can't afford that, the fourth priority mission is either the Venus Climate Mission at 2.4 billion or the Enceladus Orbiter at 1.9. And if you can't afford any of those, you get no flagships at all. Now, this is the most recent set of OMB numbers for the NASA planetary budget. They're circled in red up there. And there are the numbers for FY12, 13, 14, 15, 16. The number for FY12, the budget that everybody's talking about in DC now, is fine. It's good. In fact, it's identical to what we assumed on this chart. So we have no problem in FY12. But if you can read those numbers, you'll see that the projections for 13, 14, 15, 16 fall off a cliff. They decline precipitously. Okay, this is not a flat budget that has less buying power because of inflation. This is a budget that is going down in a big way. And if you do the math, if this is the budget we get, we have no flagships at all. None of those flagships can be afforded. If this budget it actually is enacted, then it takes NASA out of the business of flying flagship missions. And so our community, we can argue about, is it better to do Mars, or is it better to do Europa, or is it better to do Uranus, or what have you. But unless this problem is solved, that argument is moot. Okay, so this budget needs to change. Now, this is the OMB budget. We're all aware that the real budget is enacted uh, as part of a you know, much more complex process that involves the Congress as well. And my message to our science community has been that we can use this decadal report as a rallying point. Okay, a two-year effort that has the full weight of the National Research Council behind it to argue with Congress and with the administration for a budget that does not look like this, but that actually will enable us to do some flagship missions. I want to conclude by saying a few words about descopes. Uh, a lot of what I had to say about the big flagship missions, the really big, exciting, sexy missions, was about how they were too expensive and they have to be descoped massively. We have to make major changes to these missions to have a chance of them happening. 
I want to conclude by talking about briefly uh, two of my favorite massively descoped missions. Uh, at one point in time, there was a mission called the Grand Tour. And this was a mission that was going to be using a once in more than a century opportunity to fly spacecraft by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune with a spacecraft that was designed to last that entire period of time. Terrific set of instruments. It was big, it was aggressive, it was fantastic, it was too expensive, and it got canceled. The D-scope, the massively D-scope mission that arose in its place was Voyager. Okay? Some of you might also remember that once upon a time there was a mission called VOIR, Venus Orbiting Imaging Radar. This was a spacecraft that was going to go into a low circular orbit around uh, uh, Venus. It had two big antennas, one for radar and one for sending the data back to Earth. Big, complicated, aggressive, extremely expensive, got canceled because it cost too much. And the massively descoped mission that arose in its place was Magellan. Between those two massively descoped missions, Voyager and Magellan, you revolutionized our understanding of five planets. Now, you know, descoping is tough. It requires discipline. It requires giving up some of our most cherished hopes for what a mission might be. But if descopes are done properly, they can lead to greatness. Thank you. We can take a few questions. Uh, who's first? Connor. Thank you, Steve. Uh, two questions, one really quick, although it may anticipate what Micah Hearn is going to say. Did uh, um, near-Earth objects, near-Earth asteroids appear or was, were considered in the decade review? And the second question is, and I know you've speculated on, commented on this, um, what, are you, what are your views about the role of science within, around, NASA's human spaceflight program. Ah. Not whether, but how. Yeah, okay, two good questions. With respect to near-Earth objects, it was the very strong view of our Primitive Bodies panel, the group that looked at those missions in detail, that a lot of just fantastic near-Earth objects science could be captured within the, dis the Discovery program. And so we anticipate that Discovery will, in fact, pick up uh, a lot of the science that can be done there because it's so competitive. It's really, really good stuff. With respect to interactions with the Human, human Exploration Program, uh, there's a whole section of the report that deals with that. To, to, to sort of put it into a nutshell, um, we see potential for beneficial partnerships with the Human Exploration Program. But they are, in our view, good things to do only if a couple of conditions are met. And let's say we're talking about trying to achieve some human exploration objectives with a competitively selected NASA science mission. First of all, if requirements come from ESMD, they should come with money attached. Okay, we can't, it's not a good thing for requirements to get piled on without funding that is, that, that is associated with those requirements. Um, the second condition is that those requirements should be clearly stated up front. We would not like to see a situation where a proposal team proposes a mission to an asteroid uh, or to the moon and they get all selected and they've got the mission and then somebody shows up with some new requirements that require some redesign. Uh, so we think that these partnerships can be beneficial, but they have to be entered into carefully. Now I will point out that there's a great example of a recent mission that was a partnership between ESMD and SMD that went beautifully. Okay, and that was LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. That was a mission that was originally conceived within ESMD, but the instruments that they've flown were carefully selected, they were designed by scientists, they were well calibrated, they finished their mission that was focused on the exploration objectives, and then this spacecraft with its fantastic instruments was turned over to, to SMD for operations and it continues to do terrific science. So we think there's great potential for these partnerships, but they have to be entered into thoughtfully. Steve, as the microphone man, I'm going to ask my own question okay. before I turn this on uh, or to someone else. Uh, yesterday we talked a lot about um, international cooperation. Yeah. But there seems to be a problem with our decadal survey matching what ESA's equivalent or other 
agencies might be and how we match up when our priorities and all of what you went through may not match our, uh, our friends? Um, I think actually the priorities match up really quite well uh, in the planetary world. Uh, Europe places extremely high priority on their ExoMars mission. They've been working on that for a long time. And that's our highest priority flagship, is, is the mission that does that. Okay, um, the Europa mission is one, the, the JEO, I didn't have time to talk about this, but JEO would be conducted ideally in tandem with a European Ganymede orbiter mission. So it'd be two orbiters, each orbiting one of the moons, to the Jovian system. And what those can do is very synergistic science because as each of them is studying their own moon, they're also both studying the Jupiter system. So you got two different vantage points on the Jovian atmosphere. Okay, you got two different moving points within the Jovian magnetosphere. Okay, so it, it, it provides a really powerful scientific synergy between those. Um, so so I, I think the science objectives and priorities actually match up quite well. The problem is the budget. We can't afford to do all the stuff that we want to do. They can't afford to do all the stuff that they want to do. And so as we go through this descoping process to try to make it all fit, we've got to do it in tandem with our partners or else the partnerships are going to fall apart. And the partnerships are fundamentally enabling. We can't let that happen. So the descoping process has to be fair, has to be equitable. We can't force all the bad news onto our European partners. Thank you. Uh, Bill Mackey from the Canadian Space Agency. I'd like to follow on on that, that question. Uh, and perhaps I missed this. Uh, I have a two-part two part question. One, it's a, uh, could you explain to me the science, the trade between how you cut your uh, bang for your buck, science versus cost, and how you went through the arguments and sure. with respect to coming up with uh, your list. And second of all, I didn't see international partnerships on the list of criteria by which you would select the missions. Right. You talked about what each what each is doing. You didn't talk about what Japan's doing or or whether the whether your descoping uh, would could be accomplished, or the need, or reduction of the funds from NASA could be accomplished by international partners. Sure. Um, let me address the second question first. International partnerships are implicit, and uh, you know, if, if it's a 412-page report and I, that I had 40 minutes to talk about, so there's a lot of detail I wasn't able to go into. But international partnerships are implicit in all of, potentially in all of the missions that we recommend. Discovery missions, New Frontiers missions, they can have major international components as well. The, all of the cost numbers that I presented are FY15 dollars to NASA. That's, it's the cost to NASA. It's not the total mission, it's the cost to NASA. Okay, and so if you can bring down the NASA component of that cost by a, a, a partnership with an international agency, that's a great thing to do. We, because this is the U.S. Planetary Decadal Survey, we were not empowered to negotiate international deals or even to assume the existence of international deals that hadn't yet been negotiated. Uh, but we do point out very, very clearly in our report that there's a huge potential there uh, for cost reduction by international partnerships. There's something that we favor very strongly. Now, remind me, the first well, question. Like, like your national space policy calls out for international partnerships some, some 25 times or something. Yeah, it, it's there, there's a whole there's a whole lengthy session on yep. uh, session on international partnerships in our report. Science, science for uh, yeah, science bang for the buck. Okay, um, the way we did that, I mean, it sounds like a ratio, right? Okay, uh, the denominator was quantitative. Okay, we we got the cost number via the the uh, Kate process by aerospace. The the numerator, it's a sort of a squishy judgment thing, to be honest with you. I mean. We didn't try to assign quantitative numeric scores to science return. We went to, we assembled the best group of experts we could possibly assemble, vetted by the National Research Council, got them down together and said, look, here's the science that you can do with this mission. Here's what it costs. Here's the science you can do with this mission. Here's what it costs. On your, based on your judgment of science, return to the dollar, which one is better? And there were instances where, you know, it's kind of a fuzzy thing. Okay, and there were instances where we could not distinguish. For example, 
JEO and MACC, we could not distinguish between the two of those on the basis of their science return per dollar. The reason that MACC wound up ranked first, and the report discusses this in detail, is that because the cost can be broken down into three distinct parts, those individual pieces are more bite-sized and you can spread the costs out over a longer period of time, and therefore the per year costs are more affordable than JEO at $4.7 billion. Similarly, we couldn't reach a clear prioritization between the Venus mission and the Enceladus mission. So it was only where there was a very strong consensus view that one rose above another that we, that we used that criteria.